Thanks, Jeanette. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we're thrilled that so many of you folks could join us this morning for a webinar about challenge.gov. Um, many of you folks may know that we just celebrated the first anniversary of challenge.gov, and so we felt this is a great time to introduce it to folks who may not be familiar with the platform, and maybe for those of you who are familiar but just need a refresher to learn about this exciting program that you can use to launch challenges and prizes at your agency. I lead the Center for Excellence in Digital Government and, at GSA, and we're the folks who uh, sponsor challenge.gov in partnership with Challenge Post. And so we're delighted that we have Brandon Kessler, who's the CEO of Challenge Post, um, to talk about the platform. Um, I'm sure Brandon will give lots of details about the, um, the evolution of, of the platform, uh, but let me just say that uh, we have over 36 agencies who have used the platform um, over the past year. We've got over 120, we have 120 challenge challenges on the site right now. So it's really um, blossomed and grown, and this is something that um, you know is, is a big, big movement um, going forward in terms of being able to use challenges and prizes to solve some of our biggest government problems. So um, this is you know not not a fad. This is something that uh, we are definitely seeing is has huge potential uh, to be able to create these challenges. There's been a huge number of successful challenges that I know Brandon is going to show you all. So we're really just excited to be able to have take an hour um, this morning to show you how useful the, the platform is. I think what's what's really generated so much interest around it is that it's really easy to use, and it's free and it's policy compliant. And the big benefit, of course, is that you know there's one central place in government where the public can see all the challenges and prizes that are are available. So um, we hope that you folks will learn a lot about it today. We have a great team here at GSA who um, is available to answer any questions that you have after the webinar. They can give you some, you know, sort of strategic help in terms of, you know, how do you actually set up a challenge? What's really good potential for a challenge? So, just invite you all to follow up with uh, Tammy and Karen on my team if you have any questions after the webinar. So, um, I'm going to hand it off to to Brandon because he's a person that you really um, want to hear from. Um, I met Brandon several years ago when when he was launching um, Challenge Post and. Uh, He's just done a, a fantastic service to the federal government in terms of um, offering the, the platform for us and is working closely with us every day to make sure that it's a platform that works for all of the, all the agencies across government. So, Brandon, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Now, um, just to make sure, did we, was Karen going to go first? It's okay if I go first, but I, I thought that was the... Um, yeah, um, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, this is Karen Trevon from GSA, and I'll just give a, a um, no more than um, a 10-minute introduction, and then we'll pass it over to Brandon. Great. Thanks. Sorry about that, folks. Thanks, Karen. Okay, so I just wanted to start out. Um, this is Karen Trevon. I'm the Deputy Program Manager for Challenge.gov here at GSA's Office of Citizen Services and Innovative Technologies. And um, I just wanted to, for those who are you know, totally new to the concept of challenges, kind of give you a definition. Um, challenges and prizes is the term used by the uh, current administration. So, so that's the term that I tend to stick to. But you could also call them contests or competitions. Um, they allow the government to tap into the creativity of the American people. And the public can contribute their ideas to solve our nation's problems. And there are monetary or non-monetary prizes that can uh, that go along with challenges, and they allow you to get solutions that are kind of out of the box, and um, maybe even solutions that are better and faster than you might get through a traditional procurement. And uh, challenges were first mentioned um, in the uh, current president's strategy for American innovation, and then they were mentioned again in the Open Government Directive. So it's been a slow build of momentum. I wanted, I'm not going to go over all of these uh, great results, but I just wanted to hit on a few um, great things that challenges have allowed the government to do recently, like the um, really successful Apps for Healthy Kids Challenge that was done by the Department of Agriculture. They were able to get games and mobile apps worth about $5 million for about $60,000 in prize money. And not even all of that money was um, it came from USDA. They, were able to get some uh, private money, which recent legislation allows you to do. So really great return on investment there. Um, the Air Force was able to um, find um, 
a new way to um, deliver humanitarian aid, um, food and water packages. The Energy Department has um, come up with a more efficient light bulb. Um, NASA has been coming up with new ways to improve uh, food packaging in space and finding ways um, for astronauts to you know, launder their clothes in space. Um, just all these really great um, solutions to problems that um, challenges have allowed the government to come up with. So as uh, Sheila said, um, we had a new challenge just today. So we are up to now um, 120 challenges. And um, just about every agency, I can only think of maybe two or three that haven't used challenge.gov. So we've got a lot of agencies and bureaus using the site. And um, did I mention that it's free? Um, anything that's free in the current budgetary climate is, is wonderful. And um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, it's kind of around our first birthday right now. We launched about a year ago with um, 35 challenges from 15 different agencies. So uptick is really great. And um, we built this site as a result of a, a memo from OMB about March of 2010. So on challenge.gov, agencies can host challenges. Um, they can ask for solutions to problems. And that can be take a lot of forms. It can be a design, a concept paper. And there's even a photo contest, video contest, and poster contest on challenge.gov. You can ask for games or mobile apps. And the public can go on the site and submit their solutions. They can participate in discussions. If they don't necessarily have a solution to a problem, they can register their support, which is kind of like um, clicking like on Facebook. You can say, I support this challenge. And you can share them with your friends by email and social media. And of course, if you enter and you're successful, you could win recognition or a monetary prize. So um, some of the other, besides challenge.gov with um, that we're doing with uh, challenge posts, there's some other um, support that we're providing to the government challenge community. We're putting um, challenge best practices on howto.gov. Um, we support the um, challenges community of practice. And we have about 520 people on that community right now. And I encourage you to, um, if you're ever struggling for how to design a challenge of your own, go to challenge.gov because it's a really nice archive. All the government challenge, not all the government's challenges, but um, every challenge that's ever been on challenge.gov remains on the site even after it's closed. So use it as a reference. Um, if you want to do an app challenge, look at how other agencies have done it. And um, you, know, you can even uh, borrow language, perhaps. Um, you know, how do I write my rules? Well, maybe you can you know, learn a lot from what other agencies have been through. And of course, um, myself and my um, manager, uh, Tammy Marcoulier, are available for meetings and consultations anytime. I wanted to let you know that we're working on um, some expanded content for howto.gov sort of a step-by-step -step toolkit for how you would plan, implement, and improve um, your future challenges. And so that kit is going to have you know, a series of steps with original content and links under each step. So I've um, given you a couple slides about that. And um, any um, feedback that you have on that would be, would be most appreciated. We have another um, event coming up. Um, this webinar is just one of the events we're doing to celebrate our first birthday. But we're having an even bigger one on October 5th. It's an in-person event here at GSA from 9 to 12. And we partnered with an outside organization to do interviews with agencies who've run challenges. And so some of them are going to come and share their lessons learned. And we had volunteers from other agencies um, say that they want to attend. So we have speakers from um, Education, um, Energy, EPA, State Department, Transportation, NASA, and Veterans Affairs. So we have a nice diverse panel of speakers. And what we would really like to do is um, have some people come and bring their challenge ideas. Um, if you're a federal agency and you, you have an idea for your challenge, but you're just kind of stuck, maybe not sure how to get it off the ground, we would like um, folks like yourself to bring those challenge ideas, you know, even if it's just a one-page white paper, bring that to the event. And we can sit down in groups, and we can help flesh out your idea and help you get past any obstacles that you're having. So we'll have a, a lot of expertise in the room for that. 
And um, just some uh, another a couple actions that GSA is taking. Um, of course, we're always um, looking at in, in our mind for you know enhancements that we can make to challenge.gov. So we continue to work with challenge posts on that. We want to keep making the site better. And um, we were asked by OMB to set up a contract vehicle for challenge and competition services. So we have set that up, and that's them. Um, on gsa.gov, and we're continually sp expanding the list of vendors that are on that schedule, and um, working on. We're also working on training um, to help agencies use that contract vehicle. Um, of course, I mentioned challenge.gov is free, but there are um, vendors out there, um, consultants, um, for lack of a better word, that can help you design challenges. So, um, just another option that's out there for you. And I'll close out now with um, my contact information and also um, my manager, Tammy Marcoulier. And we encourage you to uh, follow us on Twitter um, and like us on facebook.com slash challenge.gov. We've been doing a kind of a challenge of the day um, for our uh, month-long birthday celebration. So check those out and, um, and uh, keep following us. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Brandon. Brandon from Challenge Post. Um, my screen showing up. Yes. Great. Okay. Excellent. So, um, thanks so much, Sheila, Tammy, and Karen. Again, I'm Brandon. I'm CEO and founder of Challenge Post. We're based in New York City, but in DC frequently, and um, we have been thrilled with the partnership with GSA and the rest of the federal government around uh, challenges and prizes. Our entire purpose is to be a platform and services company to help um, deliver challenges that drive innovation and awareness. And really the goal here is to be the website out of the entire federal government where citizens are giving the most back to government, um, both in terms of engagement and the value of their creations. We think we're, we think we're there, but um, we, we really want to maximize that as much as possible. So today I'm just going to take you through the free challenge.gov platform, show you, um, you know, what it is, how it works, what's the thinking behind it. And while I think we have 45 minutes to do that, I, I want to try and get it done sooner and not take up uh, everyone's time unless we really need to and maybe we can throw it open to questions. So. Uh, here we are at challenge.gov homepage, um, again, a place where the public and government can solve problems together. Uh, this first section here, Featured Challenges, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, your challenge can get fe uh, featured, and uh, people will see that more, and GSA is in charge of uh, appointing that. And then over here on the right, you can see a list of categories, types of competitions that are, there are, as well as the departments and agencies here that um, are posting them, so when you click on them, you can see some. And over here are recent challenges. And you can see the important information about these challenges. First, a little bit of a starter introduction about it, um, where we are in terms of submissions or the next phase. As you can see, there's three months left before this winners, the winners will be announced for this NASA challenge. Uh, prize money and the number of supporters, which really is just the people who are sort of following the challenge and like the challenge and want to stay. Uh, in the loop, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later because that's actually a really important part of challenge.gov. So um, let's click on finding challenges here, and here you can basically sort and filter challenges by the newest, by time left, by the prize amount, and by how many people are following the challenge, which is the popularity, and of course by categories and organizations over here. Um, and lastly, you can search. So let's just search for a challenge. This is a successful challenge, Healthy Living Innovation Awards by HHS. They were getting over 200,000 weekly unique visitors. Um, that's per week, not per month, uh, throughout the voting period of this challenge. So I'm going to sort of show you the bits of um, you know, uh, what people see on a given challenge and what they mean first, and we'll take you through them and why they're there. And then we'll take you through the back end of how easy it is to post a challenge and, um, you know, type things in and some of the tips that are there 
on how to make your challenge the best. So um, you have a carousel here where you can put as many images as you want, or in this case, in one image and one video of the secretary introducing the challenge. Um, this challenge has ended, so it shows the state here as being uh, winners had been announced, and there are eight of them. Over 2,000 people have supported the challenge, which again is like a like or a follow. Um, it allows you to um, update the the supporters get updated about important milestones throughout the challenge and can also tell their friends. And of course you can share on traditional social networks here. There's a status bar, an update bar, where you can, this is this blue section where they actually announce the winners here, where you can say anything you want. It could be, hey, there's this new article in TechCrunch or, um, or um, you know, we've extended the deadline or whatever status update you want to say. In this case, they've put the winners. And if we scroll down, there's a detailed description of your challenge. And these are all reachable through anchor links up at the top here on the left column. Um, important dates. And they have an enormous number of judges, which is a lot. And um, probably more than, than uh, definitely more than the average challenge. But in that case, there were a lot of people involved. So it's a huge list of judges. And each of these judges get a login. And they can go in and rate each submission based on an unlimited number of criteria. Speaking of the criteria, here they are creativity and innovation, leadership, sustainability, et cetera. So when you, a judge logs in, they will see these, and they can rate them from one to five stars for each of them. And it makes it really easy to perform the judging task. So every bit of information, for the most part, on a challenge, it's not a static web page where you just list what you want. It's connected to something else. The judging criteria here is connected to what a judge sees when they log in. And the prizes listed here, including dollar amounts, are also uh, you know, uh, dynamic information that appear in other parts throughout the site. So you can think of this kind of like a Facebook in a sense, that everything is sort of connected to something else. It's not just a static website where you just enter your text that you want on every page. Uh, and so let's go back to the top. It's, it's, as you can see by um, those links, like back to top, it's fully 508 compliant. It's passed all security requirements. It enables you to avoid having to do um, the privacy um, PRAs, I believe uh, is what they're called, because information about submitters is not automatically transferred to the government. There's a messaging system as well. So it really is just incredibly easy to engage, and it minimizes the paperwork. And all of the things that you normally have to have on your checklist every time you do uh, or create a website, you can automatically check them off from day one. So that's the home page. Um, there's discussions. These are optional, where people can have discussion items. They can form teammates. Um, here are the submissions, in this case, the winning submissions. I have different categories for the submissions. You can see all the followers along the right um, with their pictures if they want as well. Um, a blog, which is also optional, and you can turn on with one click. And you can have comments on those blogs as well. And you can decide whether you want those comments to go up immediately and be alerted to them so you can take them down. Or if you want to pre-approve the blog comments before they go up. And then lastly, the important rules, which is the legal document affiliated with all challenges. It's extremely important for those of you that are new to this to realize that these are often sort of promotional. Uh, these are promotional contracts or other kinds of contracts. And um, lawyers definitely should be looking at those rules. And you don't want to go around changing the rules and the dates and the prizes whenever you want, but that you do want to speak with lawyers because you want to make sure not to disadvantage um, any of the entrants. So I'm mixing uh, features here while showing with, and showing you challenge.gov at the same time throwing in this other information, which I hope is not overwhelming and is helpful. But um, hopefully it gives you more of a complete view of challenges as well as challenge.gov. So let's click. So that's basically what a challenge is. Um, I should say that you can customize those. So we at Challenge Post have provided this platform um, along with GSA for free. But you can customize your This is also powered by that challenge.gov platform. But as you can see, it's fully customized. You have big pictures here. You have a custom where you can look at these. The point of this is not to try and uh, 
get money from people that are on this webinar. The point is just to show you that if you do have other requirements, you want it to look differently, you want to ask specific questions, that we can do that and add customizations to challenge.gov. If you click on a recipe, for example, you can see we've got a banner here for the winners. We have a customized nutrition facts uh, widget here on the right. You can see servings by six servings or 50 servings, all prepared with JavaScript. You can print the recipe out as a PDF. This is all stuff that we've done for people. And we also do services like putting the challenges together and all that stuff. So resources and partners, GE, et cetera. So you're not confined by those features, yet they are also full start to finish for free on challenge.gov with any without any customizations. So let's actually post a challenge and show you how it works on the other side. Um, this is unique in that the admin side is um, used by a lot of people and so we really took care to make it very user friendly because you all are the customers as well as the the citizens are the ultimate users. So. Um, we can start this way by clicking post a challenge on challenge.gov. This is at the footer of every um, page on challenge.gov. Takes you here and you click apply for access. There's a video showing you about challenge.gov, etc. But apply for access. It's going to make you sign up. Um, let's just go ahead and get this done quickly. So we're now we've now created an account which is the first thing it makes you do when you click apply for access, and then it asks you specific questions. You know, what organization, what agency are you from? Are you an administrator? What's your government email address? And they ask the phone number. And then it says, I permit sharing of my personal information with government address. When you hit apply for access, an email will go out to the GSA, but as well as to people within your agency, the existing administrators of challenge.gov with your agency, within that agency, and it will say, so-and-so is requesting access, and it will have their phone number in case they don't know who you are and want to talk to you and your email address, and then they can call you up, and um, if you should have access, they'll give you access, and that's a very simple thing to do. So it really is filling out one simple form and other people approving you in a few seconds, and you're good to go. Um, that generally should be challenge, that should be government employees in general. There are a few cases where contractors have done certain things, but in general it should be government employees. Okay, so let's actually post a challenge. There's a manage button right here up on the top, and we're going to post one. So here we are. Um, let's post a challenge. Basic info, what is the name of your challenge? We are going to call this, um, you know, recipes for healthy adults, and give it a tagline, um, you know, improving lives through better nutrition. That tagline is important because it explains to people in one sentence what it is that your thing is doing. And in thinking about the marketing of your challenge is extremely important, not just when crafting it, but even after it's launched, making sure that people find out about it because no one's going to enter a challenge they've never heard of. Um, select a category. In this case, it'll be health. And, let, and you're able to post to several categories. So we'll click another one. In this case, let's do education. Um, now, what's the organization? Let's just say this is from HHS. This should be actually filled out for you if you're um, once you've got approval. Since I'm a site-wide admin, I have the choice. Uh, and then your partners. Let's add GE Healthy Imagination, who contributed money to um, the Apps for Healthy Kids campaign. And then, where will people enter submissions? This, this is a really important question, and want to make sure that everybody understands what this means. Challenge.gov allows you to run a challenge from start to finish. That means accepting submissions, messaging the submitters, um, let, uh, um, telling people that have participated in past challenges about your new challenge, getting the winners featured on the site, having everybody connected through this social network around innovation. And if you want to uh, have all of that stuff you have to host it on challenge.gov, meaning you have to accept submissions through challenge.gov. And if that's the case, you would make sure this top thing is clicked. Where will people enter submissions? On this site. However, you have the option if you are running the challenge, let's just say, on your blog, or you're accepting submissions through email, which too many people do and we totally don't recommend, and it's 
a total drag. You should never try and do this all through email because things get lost. So why not use a platform? But uh, another option could be you're using another platform or another company's services or whatever that is, and the submissions are getting entered there or on YouTube or Facebook or whatever it is. If that's the case, you have to click this button on a different site. And you will then receive a whole much fewer questions here, and it'll just show it as a listing on challenge.gov. So let's just say you're accepting submissions through email on an HHS challenge. You would click on a different site. And when people come, they'll see the challenge listed on challenge.gov, but they won't be able to see the winners and click through, and, and you won't get all those update features, et cetera. So that's the difference. So um, clicking on the site is what we're going to do because we're going to have an internal challenge.gov challenge. So anyway, um, happy to answer questions if that doesn't make sense either at the end of this call or offline anytime, brandon at challengepost.com. All right, let's move on. Save and continue. Um, so now uh, you can pick a URL, anything.challenge.gov. We're going to say um, healthyanything.challenge.gov. You can check the availability. Uh, the description, um, here's the description of the challenge. You can have a video the same way earlier we showed um, Secretary of HHS, uh, Secretary Sebelius announcing the challenge. You can embed a video and that will appear on the home page of your challenge so that people can see that. And you can upload images here as well, uh, which is as many images as you want. It could be a um, you know, logo. Hopefully it's an exciting image because, again, you want to think of exciting images that grab people's attention so that they want to hear and learn about your challenge. Here's how to enter. I'm filling this in because it's required. Here's the rules. And there's tips here. And we also have an FAQ explaining more about um, how to do this stuff. And in addition, um, GSA has howto.gov, which also has some information there and tips. And again, you can always reach out to GSA or us here on, uh, for information. Let's move on to the next one in the accordion. Here's your prizes. Again, each sort of element on the site is um, structured. Uh, dynamic data and we're going to add a prize. So this will be grand prize and it's going to be $500. There will be one winner and you can say um, $500 in cash. Let's save that as a prize. That now is an element and when someone wins that it's going to say that on their profile. Um, let's add another one. This will be honorable mention and there will be um, 50 bucks and there will be five winners and uh, no description here. So uh, let's move on to judging. We're going to add judges. You can add the person's name, their email address. Um, let's just do um, b5 at challengepost.com. Their bio, their company. Uh, we're hoping to be able to upgrade this soon to add pictures and other items. Um, let's save that judge. And again, you can add another. And then criteria. What is the criteria um, that the judges will be using to judge each submission? This is required for any good competition. And we'll just call it um, you know, uh, quality of the idea. And you can explain this like originality, creativity. We'll save that. And we'll add a second one. And we'll call this implementation of the idea. Oops. As you can see, there's spell check. And this could be, um, you know, um, stability, user experience, and public voting. We really, really highly encourage public voting. Um, often, the winner of the popular choice award, which we recommend being the best way to do that, is not always the best. It's the one with the most friends. But you're really doing these challenges for two reasons. One, to get great ideas and innovation. And the second is to expose your initiative. And public voting allows for tremendous exposure. So what, we're, uh, what we uh, might have done under prizes, well, let's just turn, uh, under prizes is add a, another one. Let's just go ahead and do that. Call that the popular choice award, because we're going to have public voting, and that's going to be $100, and we'll save that as a prize. So we're going to go back to where I was on judging, and we're going to enable public voting. All you have to do is turn it on, and whenever you pick your dates for public voting, all of a sudden everything's going to just work. You're going to have vote buttons. Um, it 
limits what how many people can vote for each submission per day, all kinds of things. And now we're moving on to submissions. So this is what people are entering, what they're submitting to you as part of your challenge. Is it a photo? Is it a video? Is it a file? Is it an idea? Um, is it um, an attachment, um, uh, architecture plans, whatever it is. So here's the instructions, you know, please submit X. And do you want an image gallery? Do you want people to have images? On or off, we'll say yes. We, we encourage you to have images for all of your submission, even if it's not a photo competition. Because again, people like images. It's exciting. It's visual. Um, a video. Do you want to allow people to submit a video? Let's say yes. But let's say it's a video challenge, and you must require a video. All you do is click video is required. Um, upload a file. Same thing. And we're not going to require a file. We'll leave that as optional. So I'm going to leave this unchecked and uh, add a website. If you want people to add a link or not, you can do that. Let's say no. Save and continue. And lastly, here are the dates. And as you can see, each time you've done something, you get a big green checkbox telling you that you're happy and you can move on. So here's the dates. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, and it's probably going to throw an error because it knows that certain things should start after certain things. Like, for example, your winner's announced date shouldn't be the same date as your submission start. But you can do all that here, and you have a nice little calendar where you can just pick your date and do this kind of stuff. And um, probably throw an error. Yeah, it's telling me that this must start before the end date. So you've got all of that built into that, which tells you, hey, you've made a mistake. Make sure to do X or Y. And then you can preview your challenge, which is going to look terrible because we haven't added images, videos, and all of my text has pretty much been one word. But let's see if it'll let us do that. Oh, uh, it's telling me. Yeah, so that's why it looks bad. But you can see that you can preview your challenge, and you get a link here, a secret link for anyone to preview your challenge. Um, people want to show it to other colleagues of theirs. They want to, um, without the public seeing it, and much better to do it on the website than a Word doc with a million different red lines on it. So that is how easy it is to post a challenge. And I'm just going to um, wrap up here by, um, there's a whole, there are a whole several other sections here about what happens when your challenge is in the public voting period or when it's in the judging period. What do you see? What do judges get? All of that is really well defined and it's really simple and we make it easy for you to run each section of the, each phase of the challenge and I'm not going to go through all of them but um, let me take us back to this page I want to show you one other thing which is this little right column here of miscellaneous stuff so if you want to blog turn it on and do you want comments from users yes discussions do we want discussions no Analytics, are we going to enable Google Analytics? Yes. And moderators, are we going to add a moderator? Yes. Now let me explain the different roles that ex exist um, as sort of the last step before showing you one uh, second to last step. So um, there are three roles. There are admins for your agency, and they have the ability to um, appoint other admins and pretty much do everything within their agency. They can create challenges. They can go to other challenges within their agency they didn't create. They can be moderators. They can do all that. One step below them is challenge creator. Challenge creators can obviously make a challenge and edit that challenge, but they can't edit other challenges in their agency. And moderators can't edit any of those challenges, but they can do the basic things like reviewing submissions, reviewing blog comments, writing to submitters to ask them questions about their submission. All that kind of stuff is what a moderator can do, and that's here. You can just add them there. And uh, they get a note saying you're a moderator with the login that tells them how to do stuff. So that was the second to last thing. Here's the last thing. I'm not going to show too much about the back end of how to view a challenge because I don't want to show private information, but you can see that all of the judges have completed their judging. If not, it tells you how many submissions they haven't completed. Here's the submissions where you can see I'm going to scroll up here so you can't see too much, but public voting, how many judges have reviewed it, the overall rating, telling you each of the criteria and outcomes, it really makes it simple. This is the back end judging where you can see what all of the judges have done at any given point in time.
And here you can click on award winners, which will allow you to award the winners. You can click on status, which allows you to change that little box on the home page that gives people a status update. And you can moderate your blog and your discussions. So that is challenge.gov in, in a nutshell. And um, look forward to answering any questions. Uh, but, uh, I lied. I wanted to show this one slide. So here's my information. Uh, and this will come afterwards in the wrap-up kit with my phone number, Brandon at challengepost.com. And um, again, our services, we do consultation. We'll help you craft the challenge and the incentives. We'll do the design and customization of challenge.gov, marketing, and um, the fulfillment of the award as well. Um, and you can avoid all of that as well and just run the challenge yourself on challenge.gov for free. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. We actually had a couple of questions come in, so I will direct this first one to you. And Karen and Tammy, please feel free to jump in or answer any of the other questions uh, as you see fit. So Brandon, must judges' names be made public? No. Um, so you have two choices. Um, you can make them public, and our recommendation about making them public really is just about whether they're well known and can become an incentive to people. So. You know, we got Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, and we get lots of great judges to um, to participate in the challenges that we run for people. And in that case, it's absolutely worth putting them on there because they will be a, a draw and an added incentive. Um, so we recommend it in that case. But let's just say, uh, let's face it, maybe they're not famous or um, it's an internal panel and it really uh, doesn't make sense. That's fine. When you go to the judging flow and you enter the judge, um, let's see, well, it, it, I think you can envision it without having to go back in there. Um, instead of putting their name, you can just put an internal panel of USDA judges. We're actually um, launching a great challenge, um, hopefully sometime next week with the USDA. It's a, it's a video challenge that's, that's fully custom and it's going to be really exciting about eating more fruits and veggies on a budget and in that, that'll be a perfect example of that case where we just say that the judges are USDA. And um, you can just show that. But it's important that you show that something is judging, some sort of entity, whether it's your agency just listed there or whether it's the people's names. Thank you. When it comes to judging, is it one email, one vote? Uh, right. So with judging, um, and we're, we're, we're working on a second option, but how it works now is, uh, you can vote for as many submissions as you want, but no more than one once per submission. So that means that I can vote for my nine favorite submissions, but I can't vote for any one of them twice. We're working on a second option, which will be that you can have that same rule, um, as many as you want, but no more than once per submission each day resetting so that you'd have daily voting, which we're excited about because it's uh, more engagement, people coming back each day to vote and tell their friends each time and learn more about it. But right now it's the first option where it's not daily. As for um, how we decipher, uh, you know, what is a user? Is it by email address? Uh, yeah, it's a confirmed user, someone who's created an account, has an email that they've entered, and then they've actually confirmed their account. We also do some other sort of um, behind the scenes um, magic, which we, we don't disclose because it would just kind of give up all the security stuff we're doing around trying to avoid fake votes. That said, people can always figure out ways to vote multiple times. And so um, we do provide a service where we can go through manually, um, which we do with all the challenges we're running, and check that there isn't duplication there um, because people can always come up with ways to try and game the system. So we're doing all we can technically, but we also have the option to add manual checks there. Thank you. Can you talk about how to frame a challenge, secret solver dynamics? Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Sure. Um, let's see, big question. Um, let me figure out this, some of the sort of basic stuff. So how to frame a challenge. Okay. The first thing is it should keep it simple. Um, 
you know, a, a, a name that's, you know, simple and understandable, a short URL. Luckily, the anything.challenge.gov sort of helps with that as a URL. And make it really clear what the purpose is. So uh, let's, since we have recipes open, let's move toward healthier food in school. $12,000 in prizes to create nutritious school lunch recipes that kids love to eat. That's what people want to see. They don't want to see, you know, um, you know, a, a challenge, you know, to create uh, recipes that meet these um, rigorous nutrient guidelines. They want to know what the purpose is behind the challenge. So the first step is crafting your challenge and doing that well. And that means keeping it simple, keeping the marketing language, you know, user citizen friendly, making them understand the purpose of it. Because ultimately, you're probably not going to have a lot of money in prizes anyway. And their incentive is not going to be financial. It's going to be non-financial. That means status and recognition, intellectual stimulation, the competitive spirit, altruism, making a difference, all that good stuff. So make start by crafting a challenge in a way that's exciting to people and they understand what's behind it. Um, second thing is um, you know, uh, marketing. So once it, this is this is related to the first, but it's once your challenge has actually been released. Again, you got to get out there and let people know, um, you know, about your challenge. And so, if you take a software challenge, for example, we'll go to meetups and developer camps and hackathons and um, post to lists um, that get to these people and do press outreach to tech blogs and also reach out to the entire network, the Challenge Post network of people that have participated in all of these past challenges as well. So it's not like you just post a challenge, sit back, and the citizens are going to do all your work. That's not going to happen. Uh, you have to post an interesting challenge, give them some somewhat excited, exciting prizes, even if they're not financial. Um, show them the value of it, and then get out there and hoof it, um, or hire somebody who can do that to get out there and uh, get the word out. because. You want people to hear about it. And then the other thing that, uh, which also relates is to make sure this is an ecosystem. It shouldn't just be a one-off thing. Ultimately, you're building a community of citizens that want to help you. And so running multiple challenges or running a second version of a challenge with you know, uh, fixing things that you've learned from the previous one is really great because you can go back to the same people that participated in the previous one and then they can bring in their friends. And pretty soon you've got this kind of volunteer army working for you. And uh, it's a give and take relationship. You need to be there and make sure that you're you're nurturing it. But you can get your job done and get all kinds of awareness around that job at the same time um, for free. So first is crafting a, a challenge that makes sense. Second is getting the word out there. And then the third is making sure that you continue that ecosystem over time. There's all kinds of little uh, nitty gritty kind of advice we can give over how long should my submission period be, when should the voting start and finish and all that, but you know we can talk about that all offline. I think those are the key the key items. And uh, this is Karen from GSA. I'll just chime in that um, we did a video recently for the uh, challenge.gov first birthday and we filmed um, via Skype some of the winners and they said that they were actually a little unhappy with um, how the federal agencies running running challenges had treated them. Like they gave me my prize, and then they kind of dropped me. So, you, as Brandon is saying, you definitely want to keep the relationship going and make your winners feel appreciated and incentivize them to participate again. And like Brandon said, they will be your little army. And that hurts to hear that uh, that people feel that they were they were dropped around that because this is this is the perfect tool to to reengage them over time and it really costs nothing except a little bit of time so um, you know I, I, you know maybe the the plan to, if you haven't posted a challenge before is try and get a pilot going you know try and try and get buy in to to do one challenge. But let them know that if it's successful, you'd want to do more and grow that ecosystem. Thank you. We have some really good questions coming in. And again, these are open to Brandon or Karen. So for full-time employees, how much time does a moderator typically need? 50% uh, of their time for three months? Can you really explain what the commitment is? Sure, great question. Um, and I know they use the word moderator, um, but just so you know, uh, I, I think I think what they what they mean is a challenge creator, or really whoever whoever is going to be involved. Sometimes the moderators are the creators. Sometimes they work together. 
Um, I think the point is how much time does it take to kind of run a challenge once it's out there? And um, so it, it totally depends, but it's not a small amount. So I would say if you're not hiring somebody uh, and you're doing it all internally, um, maybe half an FTE over the period of the challenge, um, but those come in spikes. So the submission period is out there and you're just going to want to be promoting it, but then, you know, uh, kind of things die down and then when all the submissions come in at the end and we have a graph somewhere on our blog showing that like 48 the last 48 hours you get 95 percent of the submissions so then you're going to have a real busy period at that point in time and then when you're organizing the judges that's going to take a little bit of time and then that's going to die off until the end of the judging period and then there'll be a little time before you announce winners so i should say that it I probably half an fte over the life of the challenge but it comes in spikes and sometimes it'll be a full-time thing and sometimes it won't. Now, it also depends on the type of the challenge. We are we have 14 employees here and we're, we work full-time with many full-time employees promoting a challenge which we think is the way to get the best results. Uh, and so the, the more time you put in, especially getting the word out, the best. So I'm going to answer that in two ways. One, half an FTE minimum. If you can do more or bring on promotional partners, these can be other companies that, or sponsors or nonprofits or whatever that agree they'll get their logo up in exchange for helping get the word out. That's going to going to help you. Um, and if you're hiring a, a service to do it, still probably have an FTE, but know that you'll be getting more bang for the buck. And uh, this is Karen from GSA. Um, we um, have a habit here with um, all the challenges on challenge.gov to um, tweet about them as the milestones are coming. And we have our uh, Facebook page, of course. But um, definitely, um, as Brandon is saying, I totally agree. On your, on your little core team, you know, you've got the person running the challenge, but you definitely want to have um, and just to use federal agency speak, someone from your, from your public affairs department. Um, who can help you, you know, use traditional media and social media to uh, promote your challenge. Absolutely. And when it comes to customer support, we, um, we provide that pretty much uh, all day for the platform, but we also, our customer support manager, Marnie, loves to look at other people's challenges and, and you know, just give them gentle reminders or, or answer stuff because we want everyone to, to, to do a great job. So we're also here to help around that stuff too. Great, thank you. How does an agency address liability concerns and proprietary rights? Um, no, let's see. This is, oh, this is uh, Karen from GSA. Um, back um, in late August, um, there was um, some uh, um, more, more fleshed out guidance that came out from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And um, I can include that in the uh, wrap-up package that uh, Daryl and Jeanette will uh, send out. But um, they did come up with a frequently asked questions and you know, sort of a full guidance document that addresses um, things like liability. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know, you've got the person running the challenge. You've got you know, your communications person. But probably the third leg of your, of your tripod is your general counsel. You definitely want to have your general counsel involved in uh, reviewing your rules, looking at um, liability issues, like intellectual property issues. And the good news is that a lot of agencies are, like HHS is a great example, Health and Human Services. They've gotten so experienced with challenges that they're starting to write a lot of this stuff down. And they've, um, so they are very um, good about sharing that with other agencies. So if you ever want to talk to another agency, I can facilitate that connection if you want to hear how another agency has dealt with issue X. We can um, have attorneys from one agency hook up with attorneys at another and you know, give each other a lot of comfort and you know, lawyers like to hear about there's precedent. Somebody else has been through this. So we can help make those connections. And from my end, this is Brandon. I would just add, um, again, the point here is not to try and get you to give us money, but just to give this as an option um, in case this is meaningful to some of the people here. When, when we're hired to do challenges, often our attorney drafts the, the first version of the rules and then sends it to the agency. Um, we do this almost all the time. And then their attorney looks at it, makes some comments, and that sometimes helps speed things up. Um, so that's just another option that you can have a contractor um, do that first part for you if they're experienced in doing it. 
Thank you, Karen and Brandon. As far as running a challenge, has anyone developed resources or a boilerplate work plan or project management plan? Um, I would say, um, this is Karen from GSA, um, I would say right now um, HHS has done, um, Health and Human Services has done the best job on that. And um, I'll include um, this link in the follow-up package, but I think if you go to hhs.gov slash open, um, they've put up their challenges toolkit. And it's really meant for HHS employees, but I don't think they have any issue with anybody borrowing things. So that they've um, come up with things like, um, uh, like one of the uh, requirements for a challenge, this is a good thing to mention, is that you run a federal register notice. So they've come up with a template that um, you could probably find one of those at your own agency, but you can certainly borrow HHSs. We also have tips on throughout the challenge creation flow, some of which we showed, but um, are hoping that um, over the next three to four months we can beef that up as well. So um, to answer questions right there for you. Thank you. A lot of the challenges seem to be national challenges. Can we create or can anyone create local challenges, regional, state, or even city? Sure. So um, it's not a technical um, requirement in the sense that it would just be, um, it's not the platform saying um, we're only going to allow people that, whose IP address come from this state, for example, but that would just be spelled out in the rules and it would be part of the eligibility criteria. So um, two parts to that. One is in order for it to be on challenge.gov, and maybe Karen can speak a little more detailed about this, it has to be affiliated with a federal agency or department. Um, so that could just be them um, you know, agreeing to be sort of a sponsor where they just add their logo and support but don't give money, or it could be that the agency is actually, you know, running it completely, and that would need to be a requirement. So, for example, New York City can't have something appear on challenge.gov unless they teamed up with a federal agency or department. But as for the requirements and the technical platform itself, um, the way to deal with that would just be to clearly spell out, you know, in the title and the tagline and the rules, you know, for New York State only or whomever it's for. And then on the submission form, you could um, say, you know, people must agree that they live here and there, or we create a custom submission field for that challenge saying, you know, I, I agree that I live in New York City, and they would have to check that off. And that would be a, an eligibility requirement, just like any other eligibility requirement that states you must live in the U.S. or you must be over 18 or whatever it is. Okay, and this is Karen from GSA. I don't have uh, anything to add to that other than we get asked all the time by uh, states, especially state governments, um, can, can states participate in, in challenge.gov? And what Brandon is saying is correct. Um, right now, getting into uh, state and local is a little bit outside the scope of, you know, what the White House asked us to do. So we're kind of moving slowly and um, kind of mastering <laughs> federal challenges first. But um, we appreciate the interest out there. Thank you. For challenge.gov, are all the capabilities included as part of the free no charge package for agencies? Um, uh, I wish I could say yes or no, um, but I, can, I think I can explain the question another way. So when you say all of the features, we are constantly creating and improving features. So there's not sort of a maximum list of here are all the features and um, this is only open to these and them. So we're, we're improving the free version as well. But um, I think specifically in order how to answer that, the features that are here are the ones that I showed, which um, allow you to display the challenge, um, have the video and the images on the home page, accept submissions. And as I said, you can, you can accept any kind of submission, um, whether it's a file, a video, or an image. Um, and so the answer is yes, uh, you can run a, ch a successful challenge, I think, about anything from start to finish for free um, with the features that are included. That said, um, could it be better if you customize your site so that it, you know, looks, you know, like the whatever it is you're trying to accomplish or that shows people a little bit more on the gallery so that it's just a little more user friendly? Yes, absolutely. And that really just comes down to, to the budget and, and, you know, what, what's important. So there's there's nothing right now on challenge.gov that's like, I can't do this challenge because I don't have that feature. 
I need to pay, I can't use challenge.gov. We've never seen that. You can always make do on challenge.gov. It's just that it might not be come out the way that you you want it to look, and it may not have certain features. So like partners, you don't have a partner um, tab on challenge.gov like the one that we're looking at. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not looking at my screen. Um, on the partners tab of recipes for healthy kids, uh, we show uh, the partners and their logos and their descriptions. But um, we don't have that on challenge.gov unless you upgrade, but you could very easily state who your partners are uh, and in any of number of places on challenge.gov. Thank you, Brandon. You actually were was just talking about budgeting. So, are there any budget restrictions um, when it comes to paying for prizes? Um, Karen, do you want to take that, or do you want me? Yeah, I'll take I'll take that. Um, actually, I mentioned um, uh, I mentioned a piece of legislation. That, um, it's, it was called the America Competes Act, and it was signed in Jan January of. Um, 2011, I think, and that basically gave um, federal agencies who did not have authority to run challenges, it gave them the authority to do so. Prior to America Competes, there were just a few agencies that could really do it, like NASA. Um, so I think there is a, um, I think there might be like a $50 million cap, which is really high and that sounds like a really nice problem to have if we all only had that much money to spend on challenges. Um, but I think um, that question will be addressed maybe best in the um, guidance link that I um, send you after the webinar. But if you look on challenge.gov, you can kind of get an idea of what prizes people have offered in the past based on the type of contest. Like maybe a video challenge would be a $2,500 prize. If it's um, like an, a challenge for mobile apps, well, that would go maybe into the tens of thousands. And, and if it's something really grand, like a um, design or a finished product, um, something like that could go into the millions, like the uh, Department of Energy's challenge for the um, light bulb of the future was a, was a prize of tens of millions of dollars. So they range depending on the, on the type. And if the question is, you know, how do you pay, you know, how do you actually, you know, authorize the dollars and what is that? Is that a contract or a procurement or whatever? If, if the question is geared more toward that, then, um, yeah, America Competes um, allows you to, to have prizes um, and, and uh, excuse me, uh, make awards as part of challenges and prizes and um, not have to go through the means that you've had to in the past, which may have, for example, restricted the number of winners that you have for any given competition. So uh, agencies have authorization to pay people awards. And the America Competes Act guidance does um, spell out some examples of how agencies do it. Like, for instance, Health and Human Services has a certain form that they use, and they've just learned through experience, you know, working on challenges that they've kind of learned the rope. So, um, It'll it'll be a little bit um, a little bit of a learning curve, but everybody will get it. Well, thank you. And for those that questions we couldn't get to, we will actually send them out uh, to our panelists today to answer, and then we'll send them back out to our attendees so that people can receive uh, the answers to their questions. I would like to take the time to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Karen, for such a fantastic presentation. You will receive a follow-up email from Web Manager University with the survey. We do ask that you can take some time to fill that out. Your feedback means a lot to us. We also have a webinar coming up on September 27th about QR codes. So if you would like more information on that, you can visit our Web Manager University homepage and sign up for that course as well. Karen, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, I don't, but it was a pleasure to be with you all today, and I look forward to working with everybody. Me too. Okay. Thank you, and thank you again, Brandon. Pleasure.